Welcome to the Interstitial Cystitis and Diet webinar, sponsored by a grant from the Allergan Foundation. My name is Lee Lowry, and I am the Executive Director of the Interstitial Cystitis Association. Thank you for joining us today. I've just been told that uh, my screen is not showing, so hang on one second. Um, okay, I think that my screen is now showing. Um, so once again, my name is Lee Lowry, and I'm the Executive Director of the Interstitial Cystitis Association, and want to thank you all for joining us today. Before we get started, I'd like to share a little bit about the Interstitial Cystitis Association. Also known as ICA, we are the only nonprofit charitable organization dedicated solely to improving the quality of health care and lives of people living with interstitial cystitis. The ICA update is published three times per year and is a benefit for donors who give $50 or more annually. We also archive back issues on the website and provide access depending upon annual donation level. ICA eNews is ICA's free bi-weekly electronic newsletter and currently has more than 45,000 subscribers. ICA's website, www.ichealth.org, has a wealth of free information and tools, including the ICA Healthcare Provider Registry and IC Support Group listings. The website receives more than 2.7 million page views a year from almost 800,000 users. ICA's online support community, which is provided by Inspire, is a safe peer-to-peer -peer moderated forum that currently connects more than 10,000 people experiencing similar symptoms, situations, and experiences. If you haven't already, check out ICA's social media channels, including Facebook and Twitter. Get support and discuss challenges of living with IC. We have more than 38,000 Facebook likes and reach more than 6 million people. A couple of notes before we introduce our presenters today. Your phones are going to remain muted for the duration of this webinar. If you have any questions, please type them in the questions box and we will try to address them at the end of the presentation. We know that today's topic is very important to our IC community and that there may be lots of questions following our presentation. Our, present, our presenters have graciously agreed to extend the Q&A up until 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time. So there continue to be new questions um, that they are qualified to answer. After that time, we will share any new unanswered questions with the presenters in order to collect their responses, and then we'll provide them to you in a follow-up email. We are recording today's session, and we will send a link to that recording in an email to you in the next couple of days. Okay, now let's get started with an introduction of today's presenters. First up, we have Barbara Shorter. Uh, Barbara is um, a doctor of education with an RDN and CDN. She serves on ICA's Medical Advisory Board. She's a professor, professor of nutrition at Long Island University. Um, she's a creator of the Shorter Moldwin Food Sensitivity Questionnaire first author of Diet Therapy in the Context of Chronic Pelvic Pain, in Urological and Gynecological Chronic Pelvic Pain. And she's a co-author of Nutritional Considerations for Interstitial Cystitis Bladder Pain Syndrome, uh, which is in the Journal of Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. So welcome, Barbara. And next up, I'm going to introduce our other presenter, who we're going to call Barb today, rather than Barbara. And this is Barb Gordon, an RDN and LD. She's a clinical assistant professor at I Idaho State University, a former executive director of the ICA, co-author of Dietary Therapy in the Context of Chronic Pelvic Pain in the Urological and Gynecological Chronic Pelvic Pain, and the first author of Nutritional Considerations for Interstitial Cystitis and Bladder Pain Syndrome from the Journal of Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. So thank you, Barbara and Barb, for joining us today. And at this time, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Barbara Shorter. Hi. It's so nice to be able to speak with you all today. Uh, I'm just going to mention the overview of what topics we're going to be covering. As you can see on your screen, 
Uh, I'm going to start off with uh, my plate and healthy eating and explain to you what we're going to be discussing of the time. Then Barbara is going to, Barb is going to discuss the IC plate that was developed specifically for IC patients. And then she's going to go into the fruits, vegetables, and meats so that you have an understanding of the foods included. And then she'll go on to fiber. I'll finish up with grains, milks, and fats, and then a number of final thoughts to discuss and some questions. So that's what you can expect to hear from us today. Okay. What you can see now is my plate. My plate is an online educational tool. It's something that has been put out by the government for people to use so that they have assistance with diet planning. And it's the kind of thing that is very flexible that can be used in many different food situations with very many different illnesses. And we definitely have found that we can use it with the IC patient to give them a better understanding of what they need to consume. So we'll be talking about my plate in a little bit. And the website that's listed is for you to go to at your convenience and see all the wonderful information that's available to you. And as I said, they are the basic guidelines that are available and useful for patients with and without IC. Now, I want to give you a little bit of history because it's important to know how my plate started and where we've come from with guidelines for nutrition. We have to remember that years ago, we did not have a lot of information. Around the time of World War II, men were being drafted and enlisting in the service, and they found that they were in relatively poor nutrition status. And that's what started the public clamor for some advice from our government in terms of how we can eat healthfully. But you have to remember that at that time, the issue was more deficiencies than anything else. We did not have the food supply we have now. We did not have the fortification and enrichment that we have now. We, there were a lot of different issues in those days. And so I'm going to be talking about how things have changed from an underconsumption of nutrients to now the problem with an overconsumption of nutrients. And this is what the dietary guidelines are going to explain to us. They're going to address both undernutrition and overnutrition so that we have good health. And so the second bullet suggests it's going to promote health. And in doing so, it's going to decrease the risk of chronic diseases. Now, it's, it's very difficult to deal with IC, as many of you know, but to have a comorbidity of either heart disease or uh, hypertension or diabetes or any of those only compounds the issue. And so when we talk about wanting to decrease risk of chronic diseases, the dietary guidelines are going to help us to do that. And again, this slide points out that we have very many nutrients in our current diet that are not adequate. And we have many nutrients in our diet that are far oversupplied. So what we need is the balance. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, we can't go on without mentioning the importance of physical activity. Uh, oftentimes, we just assume that people think about physical activity and we don't talk about it that much. But we really should because physical activity is an essential part of maintaining your body weight. And so we want you to keep in the back of your mind that any physical activity uh, is helpful. And so please um, make sure that you always think of your exercise as well as your foods. Okay. Now, the major health problems in the United States these days are heart disease and cancer. And you know that there's a, an increase in um, obesity in the United States. And this leads to many of these chronic diseases. And so there's obviously a gap between um, what we actually take 
and what we should take. But we do know what we should take. We do know the patterns. And so you can make the changes. And because you have IC, oftentimes people feel that they can't eat anything. And I'm hoping that by the end of this seminar, you'll, you will not feel that way at all. Uh, people who have IC have many opportunities to select from a variety of food groups. And I think it's more fear than anything else. And the fact that people are not knowledgeable about what they can and cannot have. And it creates a very uh, serious question in their mind. And I find oftentimes people will avoid eating rather than taking a food that's potentially problematic. So I'm hoping that uh, you will understand that that is not the case, that there are many, many foods that the IC patient can have. And there are some that we do know will have an effect or could have possibly could have an effect on your bladder. And so if you feel comfortable enough knowing the ones that are going to be okay, then that should give you the opportunity to enjoy your eating more. So we're going to focus on that a little bit too. Okay. Now the my plate plan is on this slide and what it points out are the amounts of food that you should consume in a day. And it's really very simple. Don't look at it as complicated numbers because they're just a few numbers that you have to remember and they are relatively simple. If you note, the foods are broken down into different groups. We have the fruit group, the vegetable group, the grains, the proteins, and the dairy. And Barbara and I are gonna be talking about the different food groups and you'll see that there are many, many foods in those groups that the IC patient can enjoy. Um, so if you look at the numbers for fruits, we're supposed to have about two cups of fruits a day. When you look at vegetables, it's two and a half cups. Grains, six ounces, which is approximately um, one slice of bread is usually one, one ounce. Then five and a half ounces of protein, and Barbara will discuss the varied proteins you can have, and then three cups of dairy, and I will go into the different dairy products. So we're going to be discussing each one of these individually, okay? So please keep this in mind. All right. Now, one of the things that I had said is that it's very important that you know what foods you are going to have problems with. And so in order to do that, you really must participate in the challenge, the diet challenge. And we have found, for, and we'll explain that, that's, that's going to um, be discussed again later on. But what we want people to do is to avoid the foods that are most offensive to most people and to keep track of what they consume, they should avoid the foods on the list and then one day add a food every third day. So if you take tomatoes, for instance, one day and you don't have any effect, actually it's a good idea to take a small amount of tomatoes the first day and then a slightly larger amount the second day, and then a full tomato the third day. And if you don't have any symptoms, then you can add that to the list of acceptable foods. So you'd keep track of that, and you would then move on to the next food. But don't include the test foods again until the entire test is over. So you would look at the lists, the two lists that are on your screen. Dr. Ohokaka is a um, publisher who just published a wonderful article in the Journal of Urology, where he found that patients who followed, very strictly followed the um, IC diet, eliminating certain foods, did find much improvement in their symptoms. And then the other list is the list that um, I had published um, recently in the uh, Journal of Urology, and that was um, the basic foods that we found to be most problematic to 
I see patients. And again, these tend to be typical. If you look at the history of uh, various food studies that have been done, you'll find that these foods are the ones that are usually on that list. So these are where you would start. You would, you would uh, ingest a diet devoid of these foods and you would gradually add them back, keeping note of what happens, and then you would avoid ones that create any kind of symptoms. Now I'm going to turn the um, screen over to Barbara Gordon, who is going to talk to you about the IC plate specifically, and then we'll continue on with the different food groups and so forth. Okay, Barbara. Thank you, Barbara. Um, Lee, if we could go back to the previous slide, I, I had a couple of comments I wanted to add. Um, and um, in, in terms of the slide and, and the challenge, what Barbara Shorter and I were finding was that the the three column food list that is really prevalent on the web in terms of foods to avoid is really quite overwhelming for a lot of patients. We were also concerned because it, it wasn't really based on scientific evidence. It, it was created based on the experience of people who had um, a lot of interactions with IC patients and were trying to put together something that was helpful. But in terms of what we know, in terms of evidence, these two studies that you see on the, the screen are, are two of the leading ones. And you'll see that the amount of food items that are most bothersome for most IC patients is not as great as those food lists. So our challenge was to create a tool for eating with IC that was less overwhelming than the three column food lists that encouraged a balanced diet because we were finding that a lot of folks, as Barbara said, were just afraid to eat. So they weren't getting the nutrients they needed. And also that did incorporate the current level of evidence. One other note on this slide is that the, the study that was done by Dr. Oaoka in Japan is one of the only clinical trials done on uh, diet and interstitial cystitis. So that study really has some good weight in terms of what we know. And um, the researchers did find that after three months, a, a diet where, and this was women only, where they restricted this handful of, of foodstuffs did help to mitigate IC symptoms. In fact, they followed the women for a year and found that um, their, their symptoms were kept in check as long as they were compliant with this diet. So that was our challenge. And um, so now, uh, Lee, if you wanna flip forward, uh, our challenge was to create an easier tool. And our solution was the IC plate. And as Barbara said, um, my plate is a very simple tool. It's been tested so that we know that this formula does promote healthy eating. Um, it's based on evidence. So we also know that by following it, you're getting the right amount of different foods so that you get the desired balance that you need for a healthy diet. If you do go to the website um, that Barb, uh, Barbara referenced on the earlier slide, you'll see that there's an option to put in your height and your weight and your age and your activity level. And based on that, they'll give you a rough estimate of calories. So the earlier slide used 2000 calories, which is kind of a typical uh, caloric level we use for a general population. But um, depending upon, your height, weight, age, and activity level, you might need more or less calories. And so the MyPlate tool will, will um, customize that for you. So it's really a nice tool. Um, it builds on uh, the five food groups. If you're as old as I am, you might have learned that there were only four food groups. But um, at that time, fruits and vegetables were combined in one group. So now we do talk about the five food groups. And uh, based on this, what we did was put together some sample men menus to help demonstrate how to use it. 
And the menus also allow you to see how you can enjoy food with family and friends, because that's another thing we often hear that, you know, I have to prepare a separate meal for myself than my family or friends. So these menus give you good options in terms of that. So with that, let's take a look at the meats. So meats and other protein sources. Generally, um, most people with IC don't have problems with most meats. Where we see the issues are with the processed meats, so those lunch meats and salamis. We also do um, see some problems with soy-based products like tofu and, and uh, veggie burgers that are based on tofu. So in, in general, the, the protein category is one that seems pretty liberal when it comes to IC. Um, the healthy eating recommendations promote selecting lean options. So like lean chicken breast or lean turkey breast. Um, and it also promotes fish and eggs, which are a good option. Sometimes people ask me in terms of eggs, like how do I prepare an egg to be safe? Um, you know, hard boiled egg is fine. An omelet is fine, but it depends what you put in that omelet. If you're going to, if you add tomatoes, for instance, to your omelet, you are adding a potentially bothersome food that seems to irritate most with IC. So then that omelet could be problematic for you. So think about what, you, what you're putting in that omelet if, if you're an omelet lover. So one of the things in, in terms of my plate, it does promote selecting lean options that are lower in saturated fat. And there's a lot of research out there in terms of how saturated fat um, helps decrease inflammation in the diet. And with regards to this, we're speaking more broadly in terms of inflammation than, than um, pain and inflammation. We're thinking about diabetes and obesity as being an inflammatory condition that's disrupting the body on a cellular level. Um, but it's interesting to think about this in terms of IC, and there's certainly a lot of room for studies in terms of diet and IC, and saturated fat is one of them. And might we decrease some of that inflammation in the bladder by controlling saturated fat levels? We don't know, but it's something to think about. There's also been some um, studies that have found a correlation between high intakes of saturated fats and stress urinary incontinence. And again, it's stress urinary incontinence is not the same as IC, but there are some overlapping symptoms in terms of that urgency and frequency. So again, this is another area for study. Might that reduction in saturated fat help with some of those urinary symptoms? We don't know in terms of IC, but by following the guidelines, and um, reducing that intake of saturated fat, you might be helping those symptoms of IC. So let's move on to our uh, fruits and, and vegetables. And you can see this is where my age got the best of me and I combined my fruits and vegetables. So I have my four food groups when I should have the five. Um, this I think is the, the area that's the scariest for people with IC. Just the, the fear that they, what fruit or what vegetable is gonna cause that horrible um, flare. And on top of that, overall, as Americans, we generally don't eat enough of these superfoods. I mean, these are just incredible foods, especially the, the, the vegetable category, which is why it was separated out. So if you think back to Dr. Shorter's slide on how much to eat, if you were eating a 2000 calorie diet, you'd want two cups of fruit and two and a half cups of vegetables. So that sounds like a lot, but when you put it across the day, it's actually a reasonable amount. And in the menus we designed, you see that um, there's a way to work it in. One of the things I did wanna really focus on was vitamin C um, because that's really um, a, a fear for a, a lot of people with IC. And it, it comes from the fact that the oranges and those citrus products, the lemon, the pineapple, the grapefruit, those tend to be very bothersome for people with IC who are diet sensitive. But the good news is that there are other 
fruits and vegetables that are really excellent sources of vitamin C. So broccoli, for instance, is an incredible vitamin C rich food and Brussels sprouts. So the, there, there's options there. Um, there's excellent sources like our watermelon and then there's good sources that you're still getting what you need like your blueberries. So there are ways that you can include um, the fruits and vegetables and still be cautious in terms of your bladder. So let's look at some of those potentially bothersome. This is definitely a theme that has emerged from the research that generally our citrus fruits, orange, lemon, grapes, pineapples, either whole or as juices tend to trigger uh, symptoms for people who are, are diet sensitive. Tomatoes and tomato products, fermented foods, so pickles and sauerkraut are ones, um, and you might throw tofu in there as well, that tend to be, um, folks tend to be sensitive to. We don't know in terms of the fermentation process why that is, but we do know um, from self-report from IC patients that it, it is an issue. Uh, one thing I thought I would address is a myth that's out there that uh, some people, especially new, newly diagnosed patients, often hear from a uh, family and friend who are trying to be helpful, sometimes from a healthcare provider that's trying to be helpful. Because I see initially seems to mimic uh, a urinary tract infection, a lot of times people think, well, just drink some cranberry juice. And um, for individuals without IC, a cranberry juice may decrease how often they get a UTI, but the evidence is really weak. But for most people with IC, cranberry juice does lead to a flare. So that's um, a myth that we wanted to just uh, put an end to. When it comes to IC, generally speaking, the cranberry juice uh, does not appear to prevent those bladder symptoms. Okay, so let's go on and talk a little bit about fiber. So um, one of the thing, reasons I wanted to talk about fiber is that for people with IC, constipation is often a common problem. And um, if you, you have that full uh, bowel, and for those of you who cannot see me, whenever I talk about IC, I always have to uh, point to my bladder. So I'm pointing to my bladder, even though I'm sitting here alone. <laughs> Um, so when um, your, your uh, bowel is full, you tend to get increased urgency and frequency. You can also get increased um, pelvic pain. We don't really know um, why people with IC um, have this increased length. There, there's lots of potential reasons. One could be because of pain medicines. Many of the pain medicines have a side effect of constipation, and so that could be the underlying cause. Um, people who are um, in a flare could be less active because of that flare, and that inactivity is a contributing factor to constipation. Pelvic floor disorders um, often lead to constipation as well. So um, if in addition to IC, you had a pelvic floor disorder as a comorbid condition, that might be a contributing factor. And we also know that diet is a big culprit. And um, so consuming high fiber foods like our fruits and vegetables are really important in terms of helping to regulate the, the bowel. Um, and if we go back to some of the things I mentioned, like uh, our broccoli, which was very, very rich in vitamin C, half a cup of that is very rich in fiber as well. Brussels sprouts are the same. Blueberries are the same. So there's definitely IC friendly fruits and vegetables that can also help you to consume that diet that's going to help keep you regular. One thing that I do like to talk to folks about is... Um, a device that's helpful if you are uh, having trouble releasing bowel, and it's called the Squatty Potty. It has lots of other names. It's a very inexpensive little plastic bench. You can get it at a, a lot of the discount stores. 
And what it does, if you, you see the, this picture, normally if we're sitting on the toilet, we're at this 90 degree angle. But by raising your feet, you're getting to more of a, a 30, 35 degree angle, which is then relaxing the colon and such that it's easier for that bowel to, the, the, the BM to fall out. So if you are struggling with um, constipation, that is, um, as I said, a pretty inexpensive um, piece of equipment that you could pick up at uh, most discount stores that you might find helpful. One other word in terms of fiber that is that as you increase your fiber, you have to also increase your fluid intake. So again, this can be something that can be challenging with IC. So if you're finding you're not eating enough fiber and you are going to start to increase your fiber, um, if you don't get enough fluid, you will um, promote constipation. So you might want to do some testing of increasing fiber and increasing fluid on, on days when you can be closer to home so you can uh, evaluate for yourself um, how well you're doing in terms of increasing the, the fluid intake and the fiber. Okay. Oh, and then we're going to go on and we're going to talk about fiber even more. <laughs> um, so I'm not going to spend a, a lot of time on this slide. I think it provides a wonderful overview and I wanted all of you to have it as a reference. Um, but what I want to do is really focus on the far right column. And that is the probable health benefits of increasing fiber and consuming these foods that are fiber rich. You'll see that one of the top things is alleviating constipation. Um, but you'll also see some of the comorbid conditions that Barbara Shorter mentioned, like lowering heart disease and diabetes, uh, lowering risk for cancer are also um, benefits in, in terms of increasing your fiber. So this is pulling you back around to the fact that by following the IC plate, you're, you're following those general dietary guidelines in terms of general health, and you're putting my plate into action. And so it's a, a model that allows you to be compliant with whatever your individual IC dietary triggers are, but also let you embrace good health as well. And I think with that, we're going to switch back to Barbara Shorter, and she's going to pick up on grains and cereals, which are also a wonderful source of fiber. Okay, hi again. Um, I like to tell people that they can enjoy many grains and cereals um, when you have interstitial cystitis and people in general. Unfortunately, oftentimes grains have a bad reputation because people think they're fattening and they feel that they should limit them. And they have all kinds of very negative thoughts about grains and cereals. And that's unfortunate because grains and cereals are very good sources of not only energy, but vitamins, minerals, and phytochemicals. Phytochemicals are substances in foods other than vitamins and minerals that help to increase and improve our health. So when we talk about uh, grains, we prefer that people look at whole grains. And the difference between the whole grains and refined grains, it's significant because a whole grain is something that's going to contain the outer portion of the bran and right under the bran you're going to have lots of vitamins and minerals you're going to have the germ which is going to have a lot of good nutrition in that also and so the whole grain is really preferred now we used to have whole grains all the time but when they started making large quantities of bread, they realized that if they left the whole grain intact the way it was, and they didn't address the fact that there is oil in the germ, then when that bread would sit, it would turn rancid because fats have a tendency to go bad, they turn rancid. And so they realized that 
they didn't really need the germ and the bread to make the a, a good loaves of bread. What they needed was the endosperm, which contains the starch and the protein. So they took out the germ, but in order to do that, they had to take away all the fiber layers. And then when they did that, the vitamins and minerals went away with them and the germ and the nutrients in the germ. And so what they were left with was a substance that was essential for making breads and bread products, but it had no nutritive value at all. In fact, it was devoid of just about everything. And it was at that time when people who were using grains as staples, they started realizing that various deficiency diseases were becoming obvious. So the government decided that they would put back some of the nutrients that were taken out in the refining process. However, they didn't put everything back. They only put back thiamine, niacin, riboflavin, iron, folate, and that is not at all near the amount of nutrients that they took out. Nowadays, we have many different technologies and ways of holding on to whole grain products without them going rancid and and that enabling us to get all the good nutrition from the entire grain. So we really do want to use whole foods and the fibrous foods as much as possible when we are um, consuming the grains. And if you look at the slide that Barbara just showed, showed you, you will see that the fiber is responsible for so many wonderful effects. Uh, in, in terms of reducing not only constipation, but lowering the risk of heart disease and diabetes and, and uh, cancer and so forth and so on. So it's definitely advantageous to uh, ingest the fiber in the whole grain. Now, the only thing you have to be careful of is the amount that you consume. Um, the uh, one of the other charts that you had seen uh, lists that you should have six ounces of the grains a day, and half of that should be whole grain. So six ounces, if you think of a, a regular slice of bread, that's about one ounce. So the equivalent would be, say, a half a cup of potatoes or a half a cup of pasta or one ounce of bread. And so a total of six servings a day is perfectly fine. It is not going to provide an enormous number of calories. By the way, you can switch the slide again, thank you. Um, the um, calories can be very easily regulated by watching the portion sizes. So we should not think of starches and grains as being um, a detrimental product in our diets, but rather a very nutritious and filling product because the fiber always helps to enhance our feeling of fullness. So it's very important that we consider the grains and the cereals when you have IC. And there really are not any products that have been found to be uh, significantly problematic. Um, the grains are generally well accepted by um, IC patients. So, you know, that's something that you should keep in mind. Even uh, snacks like um, popcorn, um, if you don't put tons of butter on it, if you just make some plain popcorn, that's a wonderful snack. It gives you the opportunity to chew a lot if you have that desire to chew. And it's a whole grain opportunity that include in your diet. So. Um, there are quite a few different things. You, you, you can have the grains made from corn and rice and bulgur and uh, various, there are just so many different grains that are available and are very tasty uh, and should be included. So, um, okay, next slide, please. Now, milk and dairy products are usually well received by IC patients. There's a question in regard to some of the cultured products only because of the, uh, possibly, possibly because of the um, 
effect of the bacteria creating the acid. When you have a cultured product, the bacteria in that product will create a slight acidic uh, flavor. And in fact, that's what gives uh, the yogurt and the buttermilk and these different products their um, particular flavor and usually the desirable flavor. So you have to really check for yourself because there, is, there are no two people with IC who have the same food sensitivities. And typically milk products like whole milk, uh, reduced fat milk or flavored milks are generally fine. But I just wanna point out from a health standpoint, it's always better to have the reduced fat, 2%, 1%, or the skim because of the saturated fat in milk. But that's about the only major concern in milk that we need to be worried about is taking too much saturated fat. Other than that, milk is a very healthy food. It's um, the food that infants subsist on when they are growing. And it has almost all of the nutrients that you need for good health. Um, it is devoid of a few, but they're minimal. So milk is a good beverage to consume. And um, I know some people concerned about milk causing phlegm. The studies that have been done do not indicate that that's actually the case. But if you're a singer and you find that milk will cause you to get phlegm, then just don't drink it. But other than that, milk is a very wholesome food, especially the low fat, the 1%, the skim, and it can be added as a fluid to your diet, increasing your fluid intake. So please remember that the guidelines recommend three milk or milk equivalents a day. And when we say equivalents, that would be things like the cheeses. Now, the soft cheeses are generally the least problematic, things like the uh, cottage cheese, ricotta cheese, those are generally very well tolerated uh, and make good milk substitutes. Yogurt, again, is very individual. There are people who can eat yogurt with no problem, yet some people find it to be uh, a sensitive issue. Now, kefir is a drinkable type yogurt. It's a, that kind of a product and it's very tasty. It comes in a variety of flavors. And if you can tolerate it, I strongly recommend it as a milk alternative. So any of the low fat yogurts, uh, the low fat buttermilk, the uh, kefir, and if you have lactose intolerance, the acidophilus milk will be very helpful. Um, so I think, that is definitely a product that should be tried to see if you can consume milk, okay? So milk is definitely recommended for those who don't have um, a flare from it. And our research has shown us that very, very few people have mentioned that milk per se is problematic. But then the question is about the yogurt and the cultured products and the um, ripened cheeses, the bacterial ripened cheeses. Again, they produce some of the acids and that could be the reason we don't know, but it is a possibility. Okay, so moving on. Now fats, very interesting with fats. For years, fats were maligned. We were told decades ago that all fats were bad. And we now know that that's absolutely untrue. And one of the things that we found out is that some of the research that was done on fats was paid for by the sugar industry. And so unfortunately, there were some biases in the results. And so we really do need to watch out for more of the simple sugars uh, as well as some of the more unhealthy fats. But fat in general, there are many, many healthy fats. And right now I'm going to talk to you about the different fats that we have in our diet and which ones are better than others. Now, there are two essential fatty acids, meaning that you, your body does not make them. You must consume them in your diet. And one is the omega-6 and one is the omega-3, uh, linolenic and linoleic acids. 
And it turns out the omega-6 happens to be the most common in our diet. It's found in our uh, vegetable oils, in our spreads, many, many processed foods. Your corn oil is a perfect example of a high omega fat um, product. And corn oil is very cheap and it's used widely by the food industry. So therefore it's in a lot of processed foods. And as we know, um, we tend to consume more processed foods than we should. That is an issue that we can um, deal with if we are so inclined and we should. Um, and so what you see on the slide is the um, statement that Americans consume 20 times more of the omega-6s than the omega-3s. So now why is there a potential problem with omega-6s? Well, it states here that there is an increase in inflammation from these particular kinds of fats. So this possible increase in infl inflammation can lead to other chronic diseases. Now, you, then you'd think, well, why should you have them at all? Well, in moderation, they are perfectly fine and absolutely necessary to help to maintain a normal um, inflammatory level to, to, to um, maintain um, normal body functioning, particularly blood clotting, the omega-6s cause our blood to clot. And we do need some blood clotting. We don't want to bleed to death. So we need some blood clotting, but we don't need so much omega-3 that it, it, it overwhelms the system. Because when you have the threes and the sixes, and you have far more sixes, that is going to overwhelm the threes. And now I'm going to tell you why the three, what the threes are and why they're good. Omega-3s, no, please go back. Yeah, the omega-3s, we usually don't take enough of. Our intake is usually limited. We have found from a lot of research that the omega-3s do decrease inflammation. But the best sources are foods that we don't typically consume often. The best sources of omega-3s are the cold water, oily fish, and the fat keeps them warm. And they, uh, if we consume salmon, tuna, sardines, mackerel, trout, halibut, these are very good sources of omega-3s, but we don't consume them often enough in our diets. We really should have two servings of these a week, but we tend not to. Um, and then we have some modest sources coming from the vegetable kingdom, the walnuts, the flaxseed, the kale, and the canola oil, which is a very good oil. The problem is that they are considered modest sources because they are not as efficient in providing us with the omega-3s. They have to go through an additional step in the metabolism in the body to provide the omega-3s that are anti-inflammatory. So again, just to um, uh, repeat what I was saying, the omega-6s and the omega-3s are both very important. They are essential fatty acids. They both affect regulatory systems in our body, but we want to balance. For instance, as I said, with the clotting, we want our blood to clot, but we don't want too much clotting. So in order to do that, we need to regulate the amount of the omega-6s, cut those back as we can. And that's something a person can do. With a concerted effort, you can limit your vegetable oils to the healthier oils. So, and also trying to incorporate more fish in your diet is excellent. Just a word about supplements, because a lot of people are taking supplements. Unfortunately, the um, literature on supplements is not as promising as the whole foods and we always recommend the whole foods rather than supplements because supplements contain only one item, whatever that item is that was being uh, advertised, or it could have more than one item, but basically it's not a synergistic relationship of all the nutrients that are in foods. So if we eat a whole food, we are consuming a lot of other vitamins and minerals that tend to work well with the other foods. 
And keep in mind too, that supplements are not regulated. That's one of the major concerns. We don't know what we're getting. And so it's questionable as to how valuable supplements can be. So again, try to have more of the cold water oily fish and try to cut back on the liquid vegetable oils and the processed foods. Okay, so the next slide is going to show us uh, another type of fat that is, has been found to be excellent in terms of our health, and that's olive oil. Olive oil has a fatty acid called monounsaturated fatty acids, and these have been shown to lower our blood cholesterol, produce powerful antioxidants and powerful anti-inflammatories. And those are wonderful for decreasing chronic disease. Um, it, I, I wish I had more time. I could go into a whole lecture on all of this, but unfortunately our time is limited. So I'm going to limit the information, but keep in mind, olive oil is a type of fat that is very healthy. It creates a very good um, blood lipid level, and we should use it regularly in place of other fats, and it will help to lower our heart disease risk, diabetes, colon cancer, and asthma. And fortunately, these fats have been found to be unaffected, I shouldn't say unaffected, but they have been found not to create any flares for patients. We have not found any patients who say that the fats um, affect their bladder symptoms. So that is a good thing. So you can focus on trying to incorporate more of the good fats and less of the unhealthy fats. Just be careful of the calories because fats do provide twice as many calories as other things. But if you're watching your calories, you can certainly fit in and you should have about four teaspoons of fat a day. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so it is true that we have seen people, some people, not everybody, some people can control their symptoms by changing their diet. You won't know unless you actually do a trial on yourself. And what that means is you have to follow the elimination diet. Now, all the information on the elimination diet is on the web and you can read it very carefully yourself. And it will reiterate what I had told you before, where you're going to very strictly follow the diet that will keep away from all the potentially problematic foods. Now, I want to stress how important it is that this be done strictly because I've had patients come in and say, well, I was, I, I gave up coffee for three days and I didn't see a change. So no, I didn't think it made a difference. That is not something that is accurate because once your bladder is affected by a product, it could take weeks for the bladder to uh, get back to normal or for this, the pain to subside. And if you cheat with just one food, say for instance, you say, oh, one day I was at a party and I just had to have a glass of wine. That can throw off, it will totally devoid the elimination diet. So any of these products, if you have them even once while you're in the elimination diet phase, you will not know because your, your bladder will be aching and painful and you won't really know what it is that caused it because it's in pain. And so you have to be very strict. You have to give up certain foods for a limited amount of time and then gradually introduce them and keep track and not cheat. I can't stress that enough. You need a good three weeks to four weeks to be sure that the bladder is going to subside in the um, sensitivity and the pain. But the next line where we say, there's no need to severely limit the variety in your diet. I hope that by the different food groups that we have discussed this past hour, that you'll see that there are an enormous variety of things to choose from. You certainly can have an enjoyable meal pattern. You certainly can have various foods from various groups and 
the other note here is to select whole and fresh foods as much as possible. Well, uh, frozen foods are fine and canned foods are fine too. So I don't mean that you shouldn't have those, but it's the, the whole foods and fresh foods should be other than processed foods. Unfortunately, we don't always know what's in the processed foods. And you'll hear many people say that there are additives that will enhance the bladder symptoms, but there are thousands of additives and there's no way in the world that we could possibly test all the additives. So when they say to take whole and fresh foods, that's because we can be assured that there won't be un uh, questionable chemicals put in there that might affect the bladder and we have no control, nor do we know what they are. So again, if you use your IC plate, that's gonna help you to focus on a variety of wholesome foods, you're going to have foods from all the different groups. If you follow the amounts that are suggested, you'll be sure to get all the nutrients that you need because this my plate has been developed so that if you consume the foods in the amount suggested, you will get all the vitamins and minerals and phytochemicals and fiber and so forth in your diet that you need uh, to uh, limit the um, chronic diseases or to decrease the risk, I should say, of chronic diseases. So my plate will help you to be sure you're getting the right amount of different foods and that you're getting balanced nutrition. So um, I know uh, time is limited again. And um, so I hope that this has been informative and that you feel more comfortable about cho choosing different foods and you realize that because you have IC does not mean that you cannot eat. It means that you just have to learn what your limits are, and then you can enjoy many, many wonderful foods. Okay, thank you very much for listening. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Barbara and Barb. Um, we are moving now into the question and answer section of today's presentation. And as I mentioned um, at the beginning of, the, of today's session, um, our presenters have graciously agreed to stay on the line for an extra half an hour until 12.30 p.m. Eastern time today to answer your questions. And we did receive a number of questions in advance of today's webinar. Um, we've also invited you to submit questions um, through the portal that you're in um, to view the webinar. So please continue to submit your questions. Um, we obviously probably won't get through all of them today. However, um, we will submit any unanswered questions that our presenters are um, qualified to answer to them uh, for, for um, responses. And we can certainly circle back with the, the folks who are on today's call with an email with, with responses to those questions. So we do encourage more questions. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. and. Um, We'll just work through what we've got so far. So um, the first question has to do with um, asking whether there's any food or liquid that is soothing to the bladder. And I'm going to open it up to our presenters. And I'll let you jump in if you feel like you have an answer to that. OK, I, I'd be happy to answer that. Um, we do not know if there is anything that's going to soothe the bladder. Uh, there are no foods that you can take and all of a sudden feel as though you get relief. That is not something that we've experienced. So we can't say that. But one of the things that I do want to mention to you is a lot of people think that if they drink a lot of water, that is going to be um, the potential soothing uh, liquid. And I have to tell you that with IC, you must be very careful to have adequate water, to have plenty of water, but not to overdo the water. Um, a lot of patients are afraid to drink because they are afraid of having to go to the bathroom so much, so they limit their fluids. And that is not a good thing to do because the urine becomes concentrated and it may make things worse. On the other hand, I've had patients who have consumed water 
constantly throughout the day to the point where they're in the bathroom every other minute. And that is just not helpful, nor is it necessary. You can actually um, make your bladder feel worse by too much liquid. So um, I think what you have to keep in mind is that you must have adequate fluid and you must have um, the amount, you know, a, 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 a number of cups every day um, so that you will be able to maintain um, normal body functioning and that you have normal urination and so forth. But um, just be careful not to overdo it. Barbara? I, yeah, I'd like to just add one thing too that um, as Barbara Shorter said, we, we don't have any evidence of foods that are soothing the bladder. But, you know, there's a lot that um, goes into eating and the emotions that surround eating. And so if there is a particular food for you that you're consuming and it, it makes you feel better, it seems to be helping your symptoms. We do know with IC that there is this psychological um, uh, mechanism as well, where you know you're in pain, you're in constant pain. There's a depression. There's there's a lot going on between that brain gut connection. So if you have an item that it seems to be working for you, I would say go for it because it might not physiologically be soothing the bladder. It might be psychologically de-stressing you, which is helping to mitigate those symptoms. So if, if it works for you, I say go for it. Those are great responses. Thank you both. Okay, this next question came in before today's presentation. I, I'm not sure that we actually talked about stevia, but this person is asking um, why it is on the quote unquote caution list. Is it really irritating? Because it's in so many things. I guess they're just concerned about it. So um, this will be another thing where we don't have specific research on stevia, but we do, um, you know, it's something that, as Barbara talked about the elimination diet, it's something that each individual would need to slowly introduce in small amounts, whatever foods have it, and see whether or not it's irritating for them. Um, because we just don't have science to say whether or not it is irritating. Yes, and I just want to add, unfortunately, the answer to many of these questions is going to be that we do not have evidence. And so um, it's very difficult to put people into a laboratory situation and have very strict double-blind placebo-controlled studies. Uh, it's a very difficult challenge. And so, unfortunately, there are going to be many things that we simply are not sure of, and it's a matter of personal experimentation and the elimination diet. And so you have to be your own detective. You have to keep track of what happens to you. You have to focus on your feelings, because I can tell you there are no two patients who have the exact same food sensitivities. There are some people who can eat chocolate and can eat tomatoes, and there are other people, just the thought of tomatoes uh, makes them feel uncomfortable. So, you know, it, it's, it's again, it's uh, sorry that we have to keep saying that, but that's the reality. The reality is that there are, there are not enough uh, studies that are good studies to tell us exactly what problematic food would be. Okay, great. Thanks. And I think I'm going to walk into a couple of questions that are going to have that response. But I think that um, just to do a solid for our audiences, we'll at least ask them and you can give that response. So um, the next one is, do certain types of food affect those with Hunter's ulcers more than other subtypes of IC? <laughs> I think our answer is ditto to that one. <laughs> right, right. Okay. I think that's okay. Ditto is fine. We have other questions we can work through. Um, the next one may also be a ditto. I have Hunter's ulcers and have had some success with pear juice. It somehow soothes my bladder. Is there any evidence that might support this? 
No, absolutely not supported. But if it works for you, you're lucky. That's really mm -hmm. fortunate. Pear right. is on the list of, of uh, juices that are usually the well tolerated by C patients. So that all we know is that the consensus is that most people find they can enjoy pear juice without any problem. Okay, great. Um, is there an allergic cause or at least a component to IC? Is that something that you guys are, can answer? Well, well I, if we looked at food allergies, there, there have been some case reports published. Um, there was a an uh, allergist in Kentucky who was doing some studies with a urologist there. And so he was looking at um, whether or not specific foods tended to uh, irritate. So there, there is that one, one theory that yes, there could be an allergic component to IC. In terms of the food allergy tests, it gets challenging. Um, because they're not considered to uh, have a lot of rigor. And a lot of the very popular tests that are out there now, they're giving you sort of a, a snapshot in time. So at this point in time, this food item might be sensitive to you, but it doesn't mean that two months later you're sensitive. So I think they're, they're being misused a lot where, where people take them and then eliminate anything that was on them. But they're just not, they're not that scientific. <laughs> so um, this is an area uh, I think of, of a lot of interest. Um, and there is, um, you know, some folks who are exploring it, we, we don't yet have that um, slam dunk answer. Did you want to add something, Barbara? Yeah, I did. Um, one of the things that we do know is that in patients uh, who have IC, oftentimes their histamine levels are quite high. Um, and that causes uh, people to think that there is perhaps this um, relationship between um, allergens and IC. And I know that um, sometimes Atarax is recommended um, as an antihistamine product to decrease the histamines. So it may possibly um, have an effect, but it's again. Okay, great. Thank you both. Um, here's some, here's an interesting question. So, so there's an, a patient who really doesn't who has IC but really doesn't have reactions to most of the foods that many IC patients have reactions to. And they're wondering if they should still try to avoid all these foods um, in order to quote unquote preserve their bladder. Preserve their bladder. You know, they're concerned that, that the food is bad for their bladder even though they're not having any reactions to it. If, if, they're, if they're eating it and tolerating it, would you suggest they continue to eat whatever works for them? I would uh, say, yeah, I would, I would say why yeah. not? Yeah, and Barbara, in your studies, you found that not everybody was food sensitive. And correct me if I'm wrong, but women tend to be more food sensitive than, than men with IC. Well, women are also a lot more, I shouldn't say this, it sounds sexist, but women are sometimes more conscious of those kinds of things related to foods. And so it seems as though women are more affected. Um, we're not quite sure because the numbers of men are um, escalating um, the more we look at them. So it's it's really hard to know. Um, it, it's just hard to know. Okay, thank you. Um, this person has, you know, does have a lot of the food sensitivities and triggers um, due to their IC, and they're finding that they're bothered bothered by foods high in oxalates. I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly. Um, yes. They're wondering if you have any suggestions for things to snack on that don't that don't have the high that aren't high in the oxalates. Is that something you feel like you can answer? Well, um, oxalates are substances in foods and in the body. Um, they're naturally part. They're natural uh, com compounds um, as a result of metabolism, and they are in different food products. Um, some are higher than others. The problem with 
Uh, oxalate has been found to be helpful with um, vulvaginia. And, but again, there's no long-term studies on that. Um, so it's, it's kind of a uh, questionable area. But oxalates, um, the problem with the lists of oxalates is that they're never consistent. Oxalates come from foods, uh, fruits, vegetables, different things like that. And it depends on where the scientist takes, what leaves they take, what part of the food they take, what measurements they use, what kind of equipment they have, what soil the food was grown on. Um, there are so many variables that can affect the oxalate content of foods. Um, and you know, there, that's a major concern with kidney stone patients watching out for oxalates and they have to avoid things like spinach and tea and chocolate and things of that nature. Um, but again, um, it's unfortunate that there's so much confusion as to the exact amount of oxalates in foods. They don't even know what the range should be for foods to be considered moderate or high. Um, I know that because I had done some work looking at that area, uh, working with kidney stone patients also and trying to figure out what to tell them. So um, there are lists of oxalates put out by Harvard. Harvard has the best oxalate list because they have a lab that's specifically devoted to oxalate research. And so if someone is interested in the oxalate values of foods, I would suggest getting the list from Harvard online or I can get it for you. Um, I have it. And then, you know, they can look at that and see if those oxalate foods make a difference. But with IC, it hasn't been as a popular a notion as with the vulvodynia. Okay, great. Thanks so much. I'm making a note of that um, oxalate resource that you could potentially provide to us that we can share with our audience. Okay. Um, here's another question. Um, someone's asking about like a general time frame uh, from when you might ingest a food that you're sensitive to and when you might have an onset of symptoms. Is that, does that vary from person to person or is that something that we can generalize amongst IC patients? Okay, well, the typical, typically, if you're consuming a food, it should go through the digestive tract and it usually takes about three or four hours before you'll see the symptoms. If it takes longer than that, it's probably not the food that's the issue. It might be something else. But one of the things that we have seen numerous times and cannot explain is the fact that some patients will have perhaps a, a drink, an alcoholic beverage, and within minutes, they can feel their bladder. Now, I remember once speaking some years ago at an IC forum, and I asked for a show of hands in the audience how many people experienced um, some symptoms minutes after they consumed a you know, certain food or beverage? And many, many, many people said that they did, but only we don't know exactly why that happens because it's, there's certainly not enough time for anything to go through the digestive tract to get to the bladder in a few minutes. So is there some nerve regulation, nerve transmission? We don't know. But there are many patients who do say that they will experience things, these symptoms in a very short period of time. But again, foods usually take a couple of hours. And if it's going to, you don't expect the foods going to um, uh, manifest like a day later or something like that. That's typically not what happens. So, Barbara, I would say that there have been some studies, some self-report studies where people said that it wasn't until several days or several weeks that they felt that they were being impacted. And we don't know why that is, but there was one um, theory I read about that it could have been that whatever they were eating, if they were continuing to eat it, that initially the it bothered the IC, but not to the degree that it was noticeable. 
So it was kind of over several days of consuming that food stuff that it finally got to the point of a, a flare. Um, so I have I have read that, and I think Christine Whitmore she had published a study where people said like two weeks after consuming they were starting to notice which as you said physiologically we can't explain <laughs> because yeah. by two weeks it's gone from the top of the gi tract to the exit route so <laughs> yeah it's not hanging around so um so that's an, an another area where that is ripe for research yeah yeah Okay, great. Um, just a time check. It looks like we have about 14 more minutes. We, we still have plenty of questions for folks who want to stay on. Um, here's a quick one. Um, what about spinach? Is that something on a list or of bothersome or, or tolerable foods? Never seen spinach on a list of foods that were uh, problematic. Um, but I can say that spinach is very high in oxalates if a person has an issue with oxalates. But with IC, we've not come to the conclusion that oxalates are a problem. So that's the only thing I can say about that. Barbara, do you have anything you want to add? No, no, I think that's the perfect answer. So if somebody had something like the comib comorbid, if they also had vulvodynia or if they also had some kidney issues, uh, kidney stones and you know the oxalates could be potentially bothersome so spinach could be a problem okay great thank you um okay here's a question about constipation someone's asking if it's okay to take um, miralax um, daily to avoid constipation is that recommended or can you answer that um you know, that's a question that's going to sort of depend on what else is going on with the person, what other medications they might be on. So, um, you know, it, a lot of uh, folks with constipation do find that uh, Miralax and, and other, um, other over-the-counter meds help. But in terms of how much to take and how often, that's something to talk to your doc about. It depends what else is going on with you. Yeah. Okay. Three. Okay, great. Here's another one. Does mineral oil irritate the bladder? Mineral oil. <laughs> I've never heard that it does, but the one about mineral oil you should be aware of is it's recommended because when you use mineral oil, it depletes the fat soluble vitamins from your foods. It they it ex helps to excrete them. So um, years ago, they used a lot of those oils uh, as supplements for kids and for older people. And it's not really a good recommendation because of the fact that when the oil is excreted, so are your vitamins A, D, E, and K. So that's the only thing I can say about that. Yeah, that's a good answer. <laughs> Okay, um, here's a question we got at the beginning of our webinar. Someone asked, is the acid level of the food the most difficult factor in determining what foods, drinks I choose? Well, we, you know, we hear that all the time, that it's the acid. But the only studies that have been done with the acid have, uh, there was a study done, uh, the doctor's name escapes me right now, but um, he had put acid directly into the bladder of the patient, uh, patients, and it did not make a difference. So we don't know if it's acid per se that is the problematic um, component. Um, it, and the other thing you have to remember is foods that are acidic in nature when they are consumed, like an orange or uh, a grapefruit, after metabolism, they end up with a basic um, urine. And so foods that are not considered acid, like meat, fish, or poultry, they would end up with an acidic urine. So after metabolism, the things we would think would be acidic turn basic and vice versa. So it's questionable as to how that all works and how it works, particularly with IC. Um, 
so I don't know what to say in that case because I always tell people that we just don't know if it's the acid that's the issue. And the other thing you have to keep in mind is there are thousands of different acidic products in very healthy, unproblematic vegetables, for instance. Um, they So many foods are just made up of acids, aldehydes, ketones, all of these different things. And they give the flavor to the food and whatever. So I think we tend to focus on acid, not realizing that there are thousands of acids that are possible and many foods that are totally safe have many, many acids in them. So I, I that's another thing we're just not sure about. Yeah, and um, sort of on that same topic, a lot of times people ask about citric acid as a preservative and um, it's in so many foods and there's foods that it's in that most IC patients don't have an issue with. So it's really difficult to say, you know, that one is difficult not to consume it and two, it's difficult to say that it is a cause of a, a flare. Um, I think a lot has to do with the amount um, the amount, it, it is true, you know, as Barbara was saying, that uh, ascorbic acid is the most common um, preservative that we have in our food supply, but the amount that's used may not be significant. That's true with most of the various uh, chemicals and substances in food. And you have arsenic in vegetables, you have um, acetone in strawberries. You wouldn't drink acetone yet, you know, you use that for your nail, take your nail polish off, but yet natural healthy strawberries have it. So a lot of it has to do with the dosage and, you know, the amount of something in a food. And I think that we sometimes worry because we hear that a food contains um, a substance with a very long chemical name when in fact the amount is so minuscule that it does not have an effect on anything. But I would say if you're worried about that, then try to eat whole food. You know, keep it keep it simple. Um, avoid those processed foods and aim for the whole foods. Um, and then you're you don't have to worry about uh, preservatives. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, I, there's a bunch of questions that came in while we were talking about different kinds of food that are good to eat, um, things to, to, to try. Um, so here's a question about milk. Um, this, this person wants to know if, if you can speak about whether or not almond, soy, and rice milk are on the acceptable list or if they should be avoided. Well, um, the thing about the almond and the rice milks are it's questionable as to whether they are actually considered they're actually milks. Um, almond milk is predominantly water with about two almonds in it. Um, so there's a, a you know a controversy going on as to whether these products should be allowed to use the name milk. Um, Typically, the only problem might be for a patient who is sensitive to soy. Um, if that's the case, then you would avoid the soy. When it comes to the almond uh, or the rice, I, I, ju I just haven't heard of anyone having problems with them. I don't know, Barbara, have you, do you have any experience with that? No, I, I generally tell folks, um, that sometimes there's differences in, in terms of brands. So you might find that one brand has something in it. Again, these are, are processed. So one brand might have something in it that's irritating, another brand might not. So if these are um, foods you like, it, you know, before you totally subtract it from your diet, do that elimination where you're gradually introducing small amounts and try different brands. Um, in terms of the nutritional value, I think that's a really important point you made, Barbara, that it's it's not apples to apples in terms of the nutrients you're getting from a milk. 
some of them in a lot of the almond milks, I think now they're fortifying them with calcium vitamin D to kind of bring up some of that nutritional quality um, that you get from, from the, the cow's milk. But that's something also to be aware of. If you are making that replacement, are you getting enough of your vitamin D and calcium? There's been some um, studies that's really kind of prim preliminary about um, low vitamin D and chronic pelvic pain. So as I said, the, the research is just starting to come out, but getting enough of that vitamin D is very important. So again, we go back to that IC plate, which was designed to provide that balance you need so that you know you are getting the vitamin D you need. Yes, Great. I totally agree with Barbara because uh, most people who will take a, um, an almond milk or a rice milk are doing it because they don't like regular milk. So then they would assume that they're getting the same nutrient components as in regular milk, which may not be true. So you have to very carefully read the label to make sure that you are getting adequate calcium and vitamin D from the milk, whatever it may be. Great, thank you. I'm so glad I asked that question. That was a good one. Um, here's a question that goes back to the discussion around good fats um, and the suggestion to, to try cold water fish. And this person wants to know um, if it matters whether they're farm raised or ocean, you know, where, where are they caught? Does that make a difference? Well, um, I, I can't give you a definite answer on that because I know that when they are farm raised, they are trying to feed them more omega-3 fatty acids so that they have because um, that's, you know, that's one of the major concerns right now is that fish provide the omega-3 fatty acids. But I don't know, I haven't read recently, uh, nor do I know the extent of how um, that's working. So um, unfortunately, I cannot give you a, an adequate answer on that. I, I, I can't either. <laughs> but I would say that Idaho salmon, I believe, is the best. <laughs> this is from our Idahoan <laughs> presenter. Okay, um, here's a question about olive oil. Does it make a difference uh, whether you use extra virgin, light, organic, and what about coconut oil? Do you have anything to, to comment there? Well, the best olive oil is going to be the uh, extra virgin olive oil because that's the one that's least processed. The extra virgin is going to be the darker color uh, of the varieties and it's going to have the most significant taste to it which is something people may or may not like usually you'll have a variety of olive oils um, and they'll be different colors and different tastes but the nutrient value of the um, extra virgin olive oil is the most. Not to say that it's significantly different than others. It's still you're still getting excellent um, nutrients in all the olive oils, but you have to be careful with the word light to determine if light means that it is light in color or light in calories. Um, sometimes a little misleading. So you have to be careful with the term light, but Olive oils in general are very nutritious, and the um, the more you enjoy the extra virgin, the more benefits you'll get. Barbara, anything else? Um, I'll take the coconut oil half of that question because oh. I did a good job on that on the olive oil. Um, so coconut oil's really been hyped a lot lately, and um, a lot of the information that's on the web about the health benefits, the evidence is, is very limited. Um, we do know a couple of things about uh, coconut oil. One is that um, it's very good for cooking when you need a really, really hot oil um, because it has what we call is a, a higher smoke point. So this means that the, the free radicals that are released in an oil that uh, have been associated with heart disease and cardiovascular disease, you're, you're not going to have that same level of breakdown of those free radicals with coconut oil at a very high 
heat as you might with some of the other uh, vegetable oils. Coconut oil is a saturated fat. So we do need to keep that in mind. Um, there's a lot of um, stuff on the web now that it's a healthy saturated fat. We do know a couple of things about it. One is that it does actually have um, less calories than some of the other saturated fats, except it's a, it's a minute amount. So like butter, for instance, is nine calories per gram. In contrast, coconut oil is 8.3 calories per gram. So it's not really making a huge difference in terms of caloric consumption. So in terms of coconut oil, does it bother I see? We don't have studies that show that. Is an overall healthier option? We really do not know. Um, there's some evidence where people are trying to see, does it help with weight loss? But the studies have um, been inconclusive in terms of that. Is it a better choice than butter? Well, maybe, but um, I think the way I look at coconut oil is that it adds unique flavors in terms of food prep. It has a good purpose if you want to really cook at a, at a high uh, temperature with that oil. So I would say there's an advantages, but in terms of my go-to oil, um, I would go with olive oil. Okay, great. I agree with all of that. Thank you both so much. It looks like we have just we've exceeded our, our deadline of uh, 1230 by just a couple of minutes. So we're going to go ahead and stop now. But I guess the one quick thing um, that I've, I've received a number of questions of people and I forgot to ask our presenters, would you be okay with us sharing um, some or all of the slides from today's presentation after this webinar? Sure. Yeah. You would. Okay, so we will plan. Um, I mentioned earlier that we're going to send the other questions out to our presenters and see if they can help us answer any others. We'll get those responses to you in a follow up email. We'll include a link to the recording of today as well as um, a PDF of the slides. So, um, thanks so much to our presenters, Barbara Shorter and Barb Gordon. You all were wonderful. I know that you helped. So many people today with all of these burning questions about how they can help their IC with their diet. So thank you so much. And thanks to everyone who joined us today. We really are so grateful that you came and participated and um, we will be following up with you soon. Thank you. That concludes today's webinar and we are going to sign off now. Bye-bye.